Hey guys, so uh, yeah, we're back at this with the screencast for cell respiration. Trying to help you guys out just before this test. Shout out to that uh, Swick Academy baseball team. Shout out to SA Squash too. Everybody's doing pretty well with that, so um, getting ready for the seasons. Um, so let's get to it. So for this test, you're going to have to understand uh, sort of basic uh, conversion of energy all starting with sunlight, uh, photosynthesis being used, uh, performed in the chloroplast to produce glucose and oxygen, oxygen being used in uh, mitochondrion to uh, perform cell respiration, produce energy. Of course, a lot of that is lost as heat. In the process, you're making water and carbon dioxide, and the cycle goes around and around. Uh, you should know uh, the exact role of each of these intermediates. Uh, I should say reactants in cell respiration. Uh, we're going to talk about how glucose is broken down using oxygen and how uh, carbon dioxide is produced, water is produced, and ATP is produced. Um, so we'll be able to account for each of these um, you know, products in, in cell respiration. Okay, skipping around a little bit. I want to skip straight to um, straight down to uh, where each of these processes is occurring. It's important to know uh, where each part of cell respiration is taking place. So you've been quizzed on this before. Glycolysis is occurring here, literally outside of the mitochondrion, uh, out in the cytoplasm, right? So if you look at this picture, you see that this mitochondrion right here is actually within the cell. Uh, and you know, if you go a little to the left, you might run into a Golgi. If you head up a little bit, you might run into the ER, the nucleus. So keep in mind that these are actually in cells. Um, the early part of cell respiration is anaerobic. Glycolysis doesn't require oxygen, and it's out uh, performed out in the cytoplasm. Uh, the important part here, obviously, is that pyruvate, a higher energy molecule, is produced, which will then be shuttled into the mitochondrion, into the um, cell matrix or the mitochondrial matrix uh, specifically. And in that process, you're going to produce uh, a little bit of ATP, only two, the only net two. Uh, and you will also, um, more importantly, produce uh, pyruvate, which is really important for the subsequent steps. Uh, citric acid cycle takes place in, in the matrix. There's that initial uh, preparatory reaction where you're converting pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. Uh, that all occurs uh, in the matrix. Once that occurs, you're going to produce a lot of electron carriers. So you're going to produce a lot of NADH and a lot of FADH2, which will report uh, to the electron transport chain, which is inside the inner membrane. So you can see these cristae folds right here. Um, that is uh, inner membrane, which is loaded with electron transport chain uh, proteins and ATP synthase uh, proteins, which will help you produce all that ATP. Right? Most of the ATP that is produced by mitochondrion is produced uh, you know, in that last step, electron transport chain um, in chemiosmosis. So there's a sort of rough overview of what we're looking at. You can also see it in this picture here. Most important part is pyruvate here being produced, uh, citric acid cycle occurring in the, in the matrix in the mitochondria. And, oops. Um, oxidative phosphorylation, making most of that ATP. So again, let's go over here and skip to an overview of glycolysis. So in glycolysis, the important part is uh, you're going to produce a little tiny bit of ATP. Okay, You overall, you make four, but remember this initial investment period uh, phase where your uh, cost it's costing you two. So you invest uh, two. So you're minus two ATP and you make four ATP. So your overall uh, net gain is two, sort of a middling amount, um, not very significant. You're also going to oxidize glucose and collect some of those electrons in the form of NADH. Um, also, just sort of a small amount. Of course, this goes off to the ETC. Uh, ATP can be used anywhere. The really important product of glycolysis is this pyruvate. Another important note is that the ATP produced in glycolysis is due to substrate level phosphorylation. 
Uh, so you're going to take literally a phosphate off a phosphorylated molecule and uh, transfer it directly to an ADP in order to make that ATP. Uh, so that's different than what we see in chemiosmosis, which requires ATP synthase to, to uh, couple ADP and phosphate together. Here it's a direct transfer of a phosphate from a phosphorylated substrate onto ADP. Okay, looking at the overall process of glycolysis, um, you don't need to know all of the intermediates nor the enzymes that com uh, complete this process. So you don't need to know the enzyme that converts uh, G3P to BPG. Overall, though, know that there's an energy investment phase uh, and some um, energy harvesting or collecting phases um, or steps uh, in this process. So, uh, again, creating a little bit of NADH, a little bit of ATP, but really we're trying to go after that pyruvate. The pyruvate yeah, is what's going to keep this process going and what's going to yield all those high energy carrying, uh, high energy electron carrying electron carriers like NADH and FADH2 in the Krebs cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle. Uh, let's see, so we're skipping fermentation here. Uh, so let's talk about the tra uh, transport of pyruvate. So this is that preparatory phase that occurs. Um, pyruvate is shuttled into the mitochondrial matrix. So you're going to pass through this inner space, pass this inner membrane into the matrix, uh, wherein a carbon uh, dioxide is essentially ripped off of pyruvate. So you go from having three carbons to two carbons. You can account for that in the acetyl-CoA here, one carbon, two carbon. And in the process of removing that carbon, you're going to also oxidize pyruvate uh, when going into, when converting to acetyl-CoA. So you're going to produce uh, an NADH there as well, which goes off to the ETC uh, to drop its electrons off. Uh, in order to facilitate this chemical reaction, uh, in, in the cyclical part of the Krebs cycle, you're going to add a coenzyme A to that acetyl group, that is to the acetic acid, and um, which destabilizes it, making it more reactive with oxaloacetate in, in the Krebs cycle. So this preparatory phase, it, you know, it's significant in that you have to get to acetyl CoA for this to work. Um, but uh, you know, in the process, you generate a carbon dioxide, you produce a, an NADH. So let's, let's see that in a little more detail um, as we transition into um, the actual cyclical part of the citric acid cycle. So this first part, we just went over conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. Um, those two carbons uh, from the acetic acid are going to be joined into the process, and it's cyclical because you can continue this process over and over again. The final product of the citric acid cycle is what's going to be used to start the product, uh, the process again. Now you don't need to know the names of these intermediates, but oxaloacetate is that leftover um, uh, molecule that is joined together with the two carbons from the acetyl CoA to produce citric acid. Right, that citrate is that first product of the citric acid cycle. And really, what's important here is not the names of these intermediates, but the processes that are occurring as you're transitioning from chemical reaction to chemical reaction. And you can see that here in the conversion of isocitrate into alpha-ketoglutarate. Uh, in that process, you're losing a carbon dioxide. Um, so you're going to go from um, having, uh, I believe it's, what is that? It's five, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six carbons uh, down to five. And ultimately, you get back to four with oxaloacetate. Okay, so you're losing some carbon. That's the carbon dioxide. That's a waste product for cell respiration. It needs to be put into the blood and gotten rid of. Um, here you see um, also that we're oxidizing all of these intermediates. So isocitrate gets oxidized, meaning it loses some of its electrons. NAD plus in that process gets reduced, becoming NADH. NADH goes to uh, the electron transport chain in the inner membrane to perform chemiosmosis. Uh, so that's that's really important. Um, so that that goes around and around. Um, you're going to produce a lot of um, high energy electron carriers in this process. You produce a little bit of ATP. You produce two kinds of electron carriers. So CC here, FADH2 is also produced, um, ending up with oxaloacetate, which um, completes the round. Okay, cruising on to the next topic, which is really important. 
that being chemiosmosis. Okay, so um, you want to keep in mind that the ETC is going to take electrons donated to it by electron carriers like NADH and FADH2. Okay, so um, those two electron carriers are going to be oxidized when they drop their electrons off. And literally this electron transport chain is going to shuttle them from one end to the other. Um, ultimately, it's going to shuttle them to oxygen. Remember, uh, cell respiration is um, aerobic and requires oxygen. Oxygen is literally pulling those electrons down the ETC. At the very end, when they're low energy electrons, we'll get back to that in a second, oxygen is going to be um, reduced by them. It's going to take those electrons and with the addition of two hydrogen ions, that oxygen becomes water, uh, which is yet another product of cell respiration, that water. Okay. Well, let's get back to what these electrons are being used for in the ETC. Uh, the high energy electrons that are dropped off by electron carriers, their energy is used to pump H pluses, to pump protons into that inner space in order to create a concentration gradient. So if we're looking here in this inner space, or intermembrane space, you're going to see lots of H pluses concentrated up here. So stop and ask yourself, remind yourself about uh, you know the, the cell transport, right? If if H plus concentrations here are low, and out here H plus concentrations are high, that is going against the grain, so to speak. So that's going from low to high and you know that that requires energy it's an active transport and the energy that we're using is those electrons that's being passed from protein to protein in the ETC now that you have a high concentration of H pluses here you can diffuse there's that chemiosmosis it's a chemical osmosis of H pluses uh, going from this inner space down back into the matrix of the mitochondria at no energetic cost right that, that doesn't cost the, the, the mitochondria in anything they're going to go from high to low through facilitated diffusion through ATP synthase. Uh, in the process of them diffusing from high to low, you're going to get the movement of ATP synthase, which is an enzyme and a transport protein. And the movement of that, of that protein is going to couple phosphate to ADP to make ATP. And that's what we're trying to do. This whole process, literally of oxidizing all these intermediates and all these processes, is to bring in electrons to use those electrons in the ETC to force H pluses against their concentration gradient into that inner space in order to create a high concentration to facilitate diffusion from high to low through ATP synthase so it spins and produces all this ATP. So we've accounted for the role of oxygen, we've accounted for the production of, of water, we've accounted for the production of ATP. This ATP is used in the cell for every chemical reaction, not every chemical reaction, but for many of them. Uh, ATP is that facilitator of chemical reactions, right? It's uh, the, uh, the hydrolysis of its terminal phosphate uh, is exergonic and can be coupled with endergonic reactions that would not normally occur unless uh, the energy from that ATP was released through hydrolysis. So putting together a lot of information, make sure you go back through your notes. You can see this from different angles. Um, it's, you know, it's interesting uh, to see this, this process in space, right? H plus is flowing. There's a lot of concepts merging together here, and I don't want to belabor that because I'm, I'm limited to 15 minutes here. But make sure you can understand these pictures. Make sure you understand where everything is occurring. Understand the flow of those electrons. Understand that ATP is made at every process, but mostly in, in oxidative phosphorylation in the inner membrane. So be able to localize all these chemical reactions and be able to compare the process with photosynthesis. We had a screencast before that talked solely about photosynthesis. There are some similarities and differences between these two processes. Uh, the biggest similarity is the presence of that ETC that produces ATP. Of course, we're producing lots more ATP in uh, cellular respiration than we are in photosynthesis, but the process is very similar. Okay, um, My 15 minutes is about up. I hope that helps. I know that was pretty fast, but uh, hey, better than nothing, right?